Mrs. Stewart, thank you so much for inviting me in and giving me the opportunity to explain to you what we're doing. You know, Rollins takes in close to 9 million pounds of toxic chemicals every year. And the kind of chemicals that they take in are known to cause cancer, or they're suspected of causing cancer. They're known to cause birth defects. They're known to have effects on the nervous system, on the reproductive system, on just a lot of things. And what you see here are a lot of the uh, symptoms of chemical poisoning. In fact, within the last couple of months, I've been made aware of about six people who've been having spontaneous nosebleeds. And of course, their doctors all say they have sinus infections. In the last year, I've known of three people who had severe hemorrhages from the nose and had to go to the hospital to get the uh, bleeding stopped. So we feel we've got a very, very serious problem here in Allison. Uh, do you ever sit down sometimes and, and feel like something's crawling on you and you look down and you don't see anything? Or, or do you get a ringing in your ears or do you sometimes feel numbness in your in your fingers uh, these kinds of things are symptoms of, of nerve poisoning of nerve damage from chemical poisoning I've had some of these symptoms that you have mentioned oh, really? I've had ner uh, numbness of the uh, fingers uh, sinus a lot of time I go I've gone to the doctor and say I have a sinus a lot of time I go to the doctor and say it's a virus and I've had a severe illness I had this illness in 1989, October of 20, uh, 1989, hmm. and the illness became worse. I had seizures, confusion, my lost my hair, and oh. uh, they me, said say that I wasn't going to live, and they shipped me to Methodist Hospital in Houston, Texas, and I was diagnosed as having gramolitis and ticolitis, which is a neurovascular condition. Hmm. And uh, there are 50 known cases of this type of disease. And they say most people have not lived, but I'm a survivor, and I, I'm, um, I'm truly believe in Christ, and I believe this is why I'm living today. But with the illness, I have to see my doctor quite often. Like this year, I've seen my doctor, I have called emergency to my doctor uh, at least four or five times. But each time I've gone to the doctor, they just say it's a virus. And I have a question the doctor whether it could be chemical related because I live in the area where Rowland is and probably could cause some of the problems that I have. But they would not say definitely that it was related to uh, Rowling or any other chemical company, company that's in the area. But I'm very concerned and I believe that with your organization that maybe we can do something about the situation. Well, the government will never say that a particular, uh, excuse me. Hello? Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. Yes? Can I call you back? Let me call you back. Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. Four, three, two, one. Did you say that only 50 people have been known to have this disease? Definitely. Was was that all in the same year that you had it, or 50 people, period? 50 people, period, in a number of years. At mm. I, I'm going to have to look that up and, and see if there's any correlation. I'd like to know where those people lived and whether or not they also lived in areas uh, where there were lots of chemicals. You're never going to be able to get a doctor or the government or any study to say a particular health problem was caused by the chemicals in the area. They're just not going to do it. But that's where we come in. What we're trying to do here is establish a health registry. And I'm going around the neighborhood. We're going to have this meeting, and that's why it's so important for you to come to the meeting where we can explain the health registry. Basically, what we will do is attempt to document the health problems of the people of this community. We'll do it by families. And then we'll get this data, and we can look at our community and see what the health trends are in our community. We can then compare our community with national norms. And if we have conditions in greater percentages than are found with the national norms, then we can ask some very important questions like, what's causing these problems in Allison? And we can correlate, in some cases, we actually can correlate certain health problems with chemicals known to be in the area. Certain chemicals are known to have certain effects. At any rate, this gives us a tool to fight with. 
however way we decide to fight with. And what's very important to understand is that the community has total control over this health registry. Each family's records are private. Only that family has access to those records. Nobody else can look at them unless that family wants them to. The community decides what's done with the information. If the community wants to take that information and go to the government and make demands on that government to come out here and do something more for us and protect us, then at least we have that ammunition. If we decide to go to court, we at least have some ammunition, something behind us to help fight and show that we really do have a problem out here and show probable cause. So that's what the health registry is all about. It's very, very important that everybody in the community participate. So we really need you. With all of us working together, we can do amazing things. Thank you. I think that would be a great idea to find out about uh, the uh, diseases that we have, a sickness that we have here uh, in the area where Raleigh and other chemicals companies are. And most recently, in 1990, Raleigh accepted nuclear waste material, and we don't know how radioactive it is, and I'm concerned about the next generation after me with this waste material in the ground. How will it affect the next generation? Oh, yes, our wonderful government has assured us that we had nothing to worry about the amount of radiation that Rollins accepted. But, of course, nobody actually knows how much they really took in. I know. Um, and, of course, radiation does cause a lot of health problems. We don't know to what extent we may have been exposed. Okay, let me do one more thing. This is, this is great. Bring it a little more. Well, yeah. And move around if you have to. Okay. Okay. Are you rolling? Mm -hmm. Okay. You say you, you had seizures? Yes, I did. And you, you, you don't have epilepsy, huh? No, I do not. Before you had the seizures, seizures, had you had any, any illnesses before that? Not like this, no. That's cough, pneumonia, something like that. Nothing severe like I had. Mm-hmm. And, and you, you experience uh, numbness even now? Oh, yes, I do. In fact, I get numbness in my leg sometimes. Uh-huh. Uh, I know that uh, numbness in the extremities, it can be a symptom of many things, but it is also a symptom of chemical poisoning. It, it shows indication of nerve damage. Um, you said you lost, had loss of memory and yes, I did. paralysis? Yes. And how many people are known to have had this condition? Fifty persons. Do you know if your doctors tested you for chemical poisoning during this time? I really don't know. I've, I've been concerned about it, and I asked my doctor to give me a, t a run a test on me, but I haven't had a test ran to determine whether or not uh, could be chemical mm -hmm. related. Mm -hmm. It, that's, that's not always hard to show because uh, the body sometimes partially breaks these chemicals down. Sometimes it's able to excrete it, but in the process, the chemical does its damage. There are experts who will be working with us in this health registry who sort of have a, a, a road map as to the avenue that a chemical takes and the kind of damages it causes so that your condition would be of, of great interest and we might even be able to relate it to some specific chemical. We also have a list of chemicals that we know have been discharged into this community. So combined working with the health registry, working with the environmental experts, environmental medical experts in the health registry, and using toxic release inventory data where we get knowledge of all the chemicals that come from the various uh, chemical plants, uh, we just may be able to, to very closely correlate some of the illnesses that we have in Allison with specific chemicals. That will be one of our aims. I, ho I hope that you can do this. That's good. Could you ask her, you told me that you, you couldn't work because of this, right? Yeah. Oh, but yeah. Let, that would be good to hear, but let me, let me remind both of you one thing. If you ask a question, and mm -hmm. Have you ever experienced, uh, have you ever felt like something was crawling on you and you look down and nothing is there? Uh, have you ever felt like uh, you get numbness in your, in your hands or your feet or do, you, do your ears ring? These are all evidence of, of nerve damage. 
I've had some of these sim sim uh, symptoms and more besides that. I've had uh, loss of memory, confusion, sluggish of speech, loss of my hair, and my hair hasn't grown back. And I had to finally get disability retirement from my job because I oh was not able goodness. to work anymore. Your kid, well, were you healthy before this started? Oh, I was in good health oh. until this happened to me. Had you had an accident or, or something? Nothing like that. Nothing. You mean you just got sick? Yes, got sick. and w What happened? As I say, though, uh, I was on my job on October the 20th. Working with homecoming, this was homecoming, and I started feeling real, real bad. I said, I told my best friend, I said, Audrey, I feel bad. I said, I don't know what's wrong with me, and they called the paramedic, and I don't remember anything until I got to the hospital. Uh. They take, kept me overnight, and after that, my illness became worse and worse, until my doctor said there was no hope for me, and oh. said she's not gonna live. And then the neurologist uh, at Baton Rouge Clinic decided to ship me to have me shipped to Methodist Hospital, where they ran all kind of tests, and they use uh, test me with different medication where they could stop the uh, seizures and somewhat some of the numbness and some of the other problems that I had. You had seizures. Yes, I did. You don't have epilepsy. No, no, I do hmm. not. Did you say that you don't work anymore? I do not work anymore. I had to get early retirement. Oh, what a shame. And I really, it had saddened me. I really had, I cried a lot when I first thought about that I had to get uh, early retirement. But then I thought about my health. My health was more important than oh, the job. of course it is. Of course so it is. So I'm trying to live day by day. Mm -hmm. What was the job? Tell, uh, tell her, what, what was, would you describe what the job was you were doing? Oh. Okay. Then I was a teacher at uh, Clinton High School teaching business courses. Uh -huh. And just can't teach anymore. Oh, that's a shame. That's a shame. Well, um, Rollins alone takes in close to 9 million pounds of, of very toxic chemicals. And then there are about eight other chemical industries right in our community that combined put out an, close to another three million pounds in our air and our water and put it in the ground. And uh, these are some of the worst chemicals known to man. They cause all kinds of problems and one common problem that they do cause is nerve damage. So what we want to do with the health registry is to be able to document the kinds of illnesses that we're seeing in Allison and uh, possibly to relate some of these, to correlate some of these to some of these chemicals. I hope that you can be able to correlate some of the illness that we have, and especially with my illness, that it was caused by chemical waste. What was it uh -huh. called? What's the name of it? Gamalitis and Ticolitis. I don't think I've ever heard of that. It's a strange name. Sometimes I wasn't just gave it a name, but as <laughs> I say, only 50 people are known to have this disease. And it's basically a nervous vasculitis condition. Hmm. Only 50 people... In the, in the in year the, that you got it? Or? No, for over a period of years. Only 50 people have ever been known to have this? No, have been diagnosed for this with, illness. Mm, that's really strange. I, I wonder where these people lived and if they also lived around chemicals or worked around chemicals. That'll be something for me to look into. I wish you would look into that so okay. can you can really understand my illness. Oh, yeah. Okay. You know, first they thought I had gallstone, then they say uh, penicillin, then they went, uh, came up with uh, pancreatic uh, 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 in infection when I went to the uh, uh, what is it, gynecologist. But yesterday I felt real bad. I was sick. I felt dizzy, but I didn't fall. And severe headache. I have a headache right now. But uh, mm. it comes and goes, and I just. Take one day at a time. You're very brave. Mm -hmm. Thank you. It would be great if she could find out how it connects. Yes, I really yeah. would like for yeah. someone to find out mm -hmm. about it. I really would. Because if people don't look into it, no one else is going to. Absolutely not. If they're paying money to have you not look into it, 
or to, right. to co-opt you somehow so that mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. our whole world needs to be changed around. That's true. <laughs> Well, we really just basically, we need to get back to the basics. You know, I, I don't know what your religion is, but uh, we're supposed to be stewards of God's earth. We're not supposed to destroy it. And then the second, that's that's our early Jewish history, and then we I'm come sure along with our Christian history, yeah. and Christ says, yeah. you're your brother's keeper. Yeah. And if we just re remember those concepts, we wouldn't have all these problems, really. I know. All in Shemekah, Seventh-day Adventist. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. What do you show? Baptist. And I'm Baptist. Say, yeah, what am I? Do. I don't know what I am. <laughs> but you know, Jewish kind of is like living your life, you know, each day. Yeah. yeah. And so I think that's kind of, I mean, you are like living a religious life by what you do every day. You don't need to be knocking on doors every day. Mm -hmm. But that's almost like become your religion is living right. a good life. Yeah, right. Even with all the sacrifice. Mm -hmm. But I think about some of these people like George Bush pretending like he goes oh. to church. What's he doing in there? <laughs> oh, oh, oh. <laughs> okay, whenever you're ready. Okay, you didn't want to follow me from here. No. No. Okay, you ready? Mm -hmm. Yes, who is it? Hello, I'm Florence Robinson. Hello. I'm with the North Baton Rouge Environmental Association. Oh, yes. We're having a meeting Monday night. It's a very, very important meeting. Mm -hmm. We're trying to establish a health registry here in Allison because we feel that a lot of people in the community have been chemically poisoned. Okay. Uh, and what's your organization? What's the it's, name of It's your? North Baton Rouge Environmental Association. We've been very active the last several years. Uh, we've been fighting Rollins expansion permit. Uh, we've been fighting petrol processors and, in general, fighting for environmental improvement in this community. Uh, we're very, very concerned about the many symptoms that we hear people talking about mm -hmm. in this community, and we know that many of these symptoms are related to chemical poisoning. Mm -hmm. And if a person has some rare disease, this is probably why they... Oh, uh, do you know somebody with a rare disease? I have one rare really? disease. Really? Well, I'd like to hear all about it. Okay, come on in. Thank we you talk very about much. It. That's it. That's it. Okay. Two, one, three, two, one. I have a rare disease. I'm very concerned about the environmental uh, situation here and with all the chemical waste, especially with Raleigh. And I'm just wondering if Raleigh could be a cause of my severe illness. Will well, I'd certainly in? like to hear about okay, it. Okay, come on in. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay. That's it. That's it. Okay. It's great. Four, three, two, one. In order to fight an environmentally successful ba uh, battle, one must educate. That Let's means, okay. Anytime you don't like how you did it, say take two. <laughs> okay. You're the director. <laughs> right. So if you flub and you want to start over. All righty. In order to fight an environmentally successful battle, Take Tom. three, no problem. Take three. The newscasters <laughs> did just go take three. Successful battle. Envir that's a tongue twister. Yes. Environmentally successful battle. Yeah, it's a good sound. <laughs> it's, it's a good phrase. Okay. Let's try it again. You ready? Mm -hmm. In order to fight us and... Maybe I'll write it down. Try it again. In order to fight an environmentally successful battle, one must educate. That means, first of all, educating yourself and then educating others as to the facts. In order to educate people, you've got to have an audience with them. One of the best ways to get an audience with people, one of the best ways to motivate people, one of the best ways to get people to come to your meetings and to participate is a door-to-door -door canvas. There is nothing like this personal approach. You walk up to somebody's door, you knock on their door, you introduce yourself, you let them see you, you're just another person in the community, you want to come across as sincere as possible, you want them to know that you really care about the community, you care about them and that you're part of that community and your problems are common, you want to emphasize people working together. What's that? That's great. Okay. Now the only problem is 
And are you comfortable talking there, or would you be more comfortable talking to me? It doesn't matter. Okay. Whichever way, whichever makes a better shot. Um, it doesn't. It looks good. In, in the cam? Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. 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 All right, whenever you're ready. All right. In order to fight an environmentally successful battle, you've got to educate yourself and you've got to educate your community. In order to educate other people, you've got to get an audience with them. One of the best ways to get an audience with people is to go and knock on their doors. When you do this, you present yourself in a very sincere and concerned manner. They get to know you as a person. They want to invite you into their homes. You begin to find common grounds. And uh, you get people angry as you educate them and let them know the problems and, and how the government has responded. And they want to get involved. But the first important step is making that actual contact. You have to walk up to that door, knock on that door, say who you are, let people know that you are part of this situation right there with them and you want to work with them to help solve these problems. Here, let me show you. I'm standing in front of Rollins Environmental Disservices, uh, which is the main thrust of our fight here in this community. Rollins takes in uh, 8,911,000 some odd pounds of very, very toxic chemicals every year, in addition to taking in radiation waste and medical waste and we who, who only knows what else. Uh, they have one of the worst environmental records in the entire state. There's extensive groundwater contamination here and they're sitting right over the one of the main aquifers for southeast Louisiana. In addition to Rollins, there are about eight other chemical plants that discharge close to three million pounds of chemicals into our environment every year. All of these are problems, but again, Rollins has the worst environmental record. We, um, in this community, um, find, for example, that right next door to Rollins, cattle graze on the ground that uh, where ash settles out from the incinerator, and bioaccumulation can take place. In the swamps where many of these chemicals are dumped are crawfish that people catch, or at least used to catch, crawfish and catfish that used to be important parts of the diet but which are quite probably contaminated now because of bioaccumulation. In fact, when you eat fish or crawfish or even beef nowadays, you have no idea where it came from and whether or not it's contaminated with chemicals. How do we fight these problems? Well, the first thing we do is we try to educate. We educate ourselves and we educate each other. We demonstrate, we march, we go and uh, talk to government officials, we lobby against bills at the legislature, and we testify at hearings. And in fact, it has been this kind of people power which has resulted in us making some very real great gains. For example, we were able to greatly uh, limit Rollins' last expansion permit so that they didn't get nearly what they wanted. That was only because the people protested and testified. Uh, in a recent DOE hearing involving Rollins taking in illegal waste, radioactive waste, the uh, plant manager was asked if Rollins intended to apply for a permit to burn nuclear waste. And his reply was, at one time we wanted to, but we know now that pressures from the community will not let us. So I can't underestimate the power of people working together. We don't have big money, but we've got people, and people represent real power. Go in for a close-up and say the last thing about people. Okay. Because a lot of cars are going by. Yeah. And you got it, you got snipped right on the last line. And we can cut it in anyhow. Okay. That's really great about people. Whenever you're ready. Um, we. Okay. okay. Uh, let's wait till this car goes. Okay. 
We don't have a lot of money, but we do have people, and people working together represent power. There's no power like people power. Great. Okay. The other way, we don't have a choice. Okay. So if you go back where you were. Let's see if I can find my spot. Is this the spot? Two, one. It looks very pretty out here. The grass is so green and it's got trees landscaped and growing around there. Rollins and other industries in the last couple of years have launched a wholesale campaign of great public relations. Rollins comes on the TV every day in our community saying, we're good people, neighbors and friends. Uh, they do little things such as giving small amounts of money to school projects or sponsoring a jazz festival or things of this sort to try and get people to feel good about them. When in fact, they may be giving a very tiny amount to this community, what they've taken away from it is far greater and in fact no money can buy it because they and the other chemical industries are taking away our very health, our very quality of life. That's incredibly great. I just thought of something. Was she matching in the same place she was standing? Four, three, two, one. It looks very pretty here. The grass is very green and with the trees it's nicely landscaped. Rollins and other industries over the last couple of years have launched an incredible campaign of public relations. Rollins comes on the TV every day in our community saying, we're good folks, good people, your neighbors from Rollins. They drop a few dollars here and there into the community to support a school program or to support a blues festival or some other very small thing. And they want people to think how great they are when in fact the very serious problems over here and what they give to this community is not even a drop in the bucket to what they've taken away they're today and the other industries are taking away our very health and our
Okay, five, four, three, two, one. Okay. Well, Mr. Jackson, uh, you had a you had a nice home and some nice land down in Cocoa Road. Uh, and y'all seem to be you you and your mother and all was living close together down there. Y'all seem to be been happy down there. What motivated you to, to move out and come here in, in this place here? Well, Amy, as you know, we only 660 feet from the, from those plant over there. Uh, pollution was so bad, therefore we decided to move about 210 miles in this area. Uh, this is a peaceful area, as you know. Uh, therefore, we hate to move out of this area. However, with the pollution being so great, and as you know, with no rules and regulation laws, uh, telling the plant how much pollution they can put in the air. Um, um, all our stream was rotten and what have you, so we d decided to move up here. You mean the screen in the window, the, the chemical was actually deteriorating the screen? In the Definitely. You, can go, you, you may go down there right now and see that. Uh, we had to, move, had to change the stream every year. So therefore, I think it was very... Did you know if any people took sick, some kind of sickness that uh, you, you, in your mind, <coughs> you thinking that was uh, a chemical related sickness in, in that particular place you was living in. Well, I feel that clo as close as you are is more detrimental is the pollution to you. So I feel that the uh, further away we get it back from the plant, there's a possibility that we can at least as, wouldn't suffer as much as greater than that being that close. Because we have, remember that we have, uh, we were so close, uh, only 660 feet. I can hit a baseball more that far. That's right. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I, I, I know of a fact that uh, uh, it's a lot of people had illness down there as far as scientists, and their eyes would run water, and a lot of little small children. Uh, from what some people was telling me back there, where, as far as uh, Robert Jackson, where he lived, we call him Doctor, yeah. back in there. Uh, that's the same road you was living on. Yeah, I, you know, we live on Cocoa Land, right. and as you know, Amos, uh, it's, you know, the plane came here in 1957, and we have seen some, definitely some changes. Right. And uh, those changes, as you mentioned, you know, uh, irritation of the throat and eyes and what have you. And what particular plant, we don't know, but we don't know, use that word plants, and we know they come out there from the plant area. Well, uh, uh, <coughs> Could you remember if your daddy ever suffered from the illness that he died with before he took down terminal sick? Uh, do you know what your daddy died with? Uh, he died with cancer. Cancer. How long had he been living down in Cocoa Bay? Do you know? Um, at least 30 years for sure. 30 years? Yeah. Uh -huh. And uh, uh, your wife, too, was living down there when she contacted her cancer. Yeah. Uh, you know, we feel, Amos, that with the amount of pollution in the air, and these people, these people put thousands of pounds of pollution in the air, and it's probably not going to affect you right then. It takes a little while, and around 15 to 20 years, and it starts showing. Of course, you can see what's happening right now. Though we have, oh my, uh, quite a few people with that uh, disease right now. Well, I, I received a complaint from that same location down there that some mornings these people would get up and the whole top of the house was white, looked like snow had fell at night. And the automobiles and things was covered. And you could tell almost every car that at during that time was on a cocoa road uh, because of this stuff that was falling out the air on top of the automobile because it all rusted up. Do you remember seeing any kind of that stuff on, on your house while you was living on there? Of course, yeah. Uh, as I say, you know, there was no laws to prevent how much of pollution for those plant to put in the air, and they put well they wanted to. And that's the closest in the injection well we have to anybody out in that area out there. Definitely, yeah. Right. Where we were. Uh, only four tenths of a mile. I gauged it on my car. In from, from it the, less than four ten, him. Okay. It less than four ten. Well, yeah. Mm -hmm. And then. Uh, uh, the water and thing, did you all have any problem with the water down there? Uh, with my mother well, we had problem. 
but not my well. My well was 550 feet deep. Well, you were Yeah, and they operated, uh, my mother was probably 280, 275. It was on Anacor. Yeah, they had a problem with their well. Well, uh, do you know of any other people down in, in Cocoa Road that had uh, sickness uh, that you would would believe that it was uh, chemical related sickness on Cocoa Road? There's 27 family lived down there. Well, I couldn't specifically say it came from the right on from that. Um, I have an ideal point of view, you know. Where you come. Uh, this guy, uh, this little boy, uh, my aunt had down there that had cancer all over his body down there. He wasn't living far from you. Definitely. Right. Mm -hmm. We call him Honey. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that that boy still living. I can't see how he how he how he pulled. Him. Well, you know, I was, actually the kid lived almost next door to us. Right. And that's another problem with here. This kid was. 16 years old when he right. came down with cancer? 16 years old. Yeah. And yeah, I wanted to just bring up one thing. We're going to end up cutting your words out. So if he answers you, he has to include the whole story. Uh -huh. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? We won't have the conversation in. Uh -huh. We'll just have, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Okay. Can you repeat the question? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, uh, how old are you now? I'm talking to you. Uh, Christina? Me? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, 14. Huh? 14. 14. Okay. Well, uh, do you remember you testifying in the courts in Baton Rouge on the environmental problems we was having out here, guys? Would you tell a story to to the to this uh, news this uh, these people? Can't you remember? On what? On what? <laughs> when you testify in at DEQ on the environmental problems we was having out here. You were small then, and you did a wonderful job of that. Could you relate that same subject to the, to the camera and the, the videotape we, we recording on you now? Okay, no, I remember. <laughs> okay, this was in Baton Rouge, and um, if I can remember precisely, they're, they're trying to, um, Put some old ejection well out there in the guys. Ejection oh, well, yeah. Yeah, and child two was there. Yeah. yeah. Um. But to figure, I want you to know what what you your point of view of it. Been a long time. A long yeah, time. <laughs> well, I remember being there. But. Okay then, I would like to ask you, how do you feel about? The, the smells we have around here from the chemical industries. And how do you feel as a young teenager being raised in an area like this one here? Are you afraid to live here? Are you, uh, 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 do, is that a problem to other teenagers along there in your own age? Uh, the teenagers my age, they don't worry about it. They feel that they can't catch nothing from it. They'd be playing basketball if they're bad, they don't care. They just... Do you know of anybody that complains uh, in a teenager's bracket that complains about this stuff out of guys? No. Do you have a story you would like to tell us on tape? Uh, something related to the water or the air or the pollution here at guys? Yeah, it's before you take them, maybe it's Okay, uh, when, when he's talking about the pollution, do you have, not, you have in mind what he's talking about, what it is? Yeah, I know. Okay, well, let's, let's talk about that, pollution. Okay. Uh, uh, okay, the, some of those plants are making various chemicals, mm -hmm. and a lot of those chemicals, it causes cancer. Yeah. Uh, could you think of any one chemical they're making out there? Benzene. Benzene? Yeah, that, that, right out here, about 2.5 miles from here. And that's a cause of cancer. Cancer, cancer. Yeah, mm -hmm. AIDS. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, we going on there more than that. Uh, I don't know, we may be letting out different smell. Well, you yeah. know, it, 
I would like to inject that there, uh, uh, Mr. Jackson. It came out in, the, in last week's paper that they find they had found out that uh, PBCs causing these women with breast cancer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Definitely, they got the the Center for Disease Control in Atlanta, Georgia, have, have come to the conclusion that that's what caused breast cancer in the women, mm -hmm. in some men. Well, uh, Mr. Jackson, if you if you would have to move again, would you move back to your house on Coco Road? No way. <laughs> and could you tell us? Could you tell us what they tried to do out there on Coco Road at first, as best as is concerned? Oh God, thank you, you know, uh, in this predominant, I hate to use, say this, but it's the facts. Uh, this area is a predominantly black area, and as you know, all over the country, you'll find uh, they put these plants in what are all sort of other kind in our area. And the technology will tell you nothing's going to happen to you. They don't know. They can't prove it. But 20, 25, 30 years later, then these symptoms are starting to occur. Um, Definitely, I would not move any closer to the plane. I feel, however, in the next 50 or 100 years, the technology probably will clear up the air about 95%. They can if they put the money out. They can do it. And I, like I said in the, uh, many times before, um, I feel if the plant can find the technology to make the chemical, they can find the technology getting rid of it. They can er eradicate that. Uh, overnight. But the point is, it's the dollar sign. It costs them money to do that. So therefore, if they, make, if, if they can make a big profit without spending it, they're going to do it. And uh, it will be up to us to fight it like we started fighting 20 years ago. And just, uh, just like we said, it happened uh, 20 years later, you'll start seeing things. And you know that you said they won't put that bastard over there, right in front of my old house. And they're going to cover about six inches of dirt. And you know, in this area, we're living in a, a flood zone here, and you're going to put that kind of stuff in there. You know what's going to happen, and the animal going to be digging it up, and no one in the world we could go along there. However, our association uh, demonstrated that and decided to go someplace else. However, I feel bad for those people who will have that in their backyard. It's not good. And uh, you know it when it, that first came out, it was nothing happened. It was no danger. It wasn't danger, what have you. Right now, 20 years, 30 years later, uh, later now they're finding has it to the hell. Do you know of any other members of your family besides your dad and your wife that, that had cancer and uh, you lost through death by cancer? Not in this area. No, I didn't. Your mother, though. Yeah, yeah. Your, your mother or died of cancer, yeah? Yeah, but she living in another close by another plant area. You know the same. <laughs> we get chemical from them here. You can smell that. Yeah, yeah. Coming over there in West Baton Rouge. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's almost in the same place. Yeah. Just across the river. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and then also your father-in-law died with cancer, too, wasn't it? Yeah. Uh -huh. So close. the cancer is raging there? Yeah, close to the planet. Right. Because they were next door, they were less than... Yeah, they were close. Less than 100 yards. They were less than 100 yards from the plants. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, Mr. Jackson, when before we start drilling our own wells here, we used to have to to have system side of a house that water run off the house into the system and that's what we used to drink. Do you believe in your opinion right now we could drink that water and not get sick? Oh, you probably dead by now, Emma. <laughs> <laughs> really, I, you know, I'm not trying to be funny or anything, seriously, but uh, with the amount of pollution in the air, water, I mean, with that uh, chemical on top of your house, on the houses, I think 9% of people in the area probably would have been deceived for many years. Do you remember when the Ascension Parish resident against toxic pollution 
uh, took up this fight against this man that was bringing human feces here uh, down uh, Cornerview Road there. Very much. <laughs> do, do you remember uh, what a hot time we have at the fire station? Could you elaborate on that a little while so the people could understand that see this film, could understand what we're going through here at Cosmo? It's not only the plants, the dollar sign as you just mentioned. Yeah, well, this guy was from Houston, and uh, he was going to put a dump right behind our church, uh, about, um, about 200 feet. And that's, much, and that's a wise guess, 200 feet or closer. And they're going to maintain the dump and what have you. And we met right at, at the um, Masonic Hall here in Geisman. And, well, peacefully, as we know how to go through the uh, procedure and tell these people we don't want that dump in our backyard. Anyway, he, he showed us a uh, film, uh, one uh, waste dump or what have you, in Houston. Every day they cover the ground up and it's perfect. And I told that guy, I said, look, uh, we here, we don't want a dump in our backyard. That, Amos, that dump was right about 640 feet from my house, back of my house. Right. So uh, actually, I had a, a really concerning interest in that dump. So anyway, uh, we told him that probably going to be some confrontation and uh, maybe violence uh, coming from this if he decided to come in and dump in there. And I remember precisely a fellow weighing about 290 pounds going to operate this dozer. And he, I said, man, I said, if I were you, I wouldn't come in there Monday morning and do that because we're going probably going to have a little trouble with that. And he told me, he said, big man got tough high. I said, well, the big man would need a tough high Monday. So on my way back from work, uh, surprisingly, I got there about 100 yards, and I saw about three or 400 people. And there, that tough man pleading for his life. <laughs> so uh, at that time, this man left God and went to Sorrento Dump. And you know what happened? The five hazard dump in the United States, we had three of them right here in Ascension Parish. So I give you an idea of how dangerous these dumps are. And which one of them was the most poisonous? That, that, that one in Sorrento. And what that, is going to be looking We're right in our backyard in God's mirror. Do you have anybody else in your family who would like to be on this video with you and your daughter? Oh, yeah. I I one of your sons was with us testifying up there. I would like, if he here, I would like for him to come up there and pass his view on you. Yeah. Jackie, come up here, boy. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Well. For the, for the purpose of the, of the tape, this tape will be shown on television in that way. What is your name? My name is Edward Jackson, Jr. Edward Jackson, Jr. Uh, do you remember testifying uh, at an oversight committee in Baton Rouge pertaining to environmental affairs here in Geisman? Yes, I do. I uh, remember uh, one particular meeting that we had with, with the, the, the Department of Environment uh, Quality. Yeah. Um, it was concerned at that uh, the same dump that my father mentioned earlier, where uh, uh, they wanted to have some kind of uh, a waste dump uh, somewhere right down right down the road there. Um, they were going to pump human feces some kind of way in, in the ditches and open pit. Yeah, it, it was just an open pit and that kind of thing. And uh, but we were vehement against that, and uh, uh, luckily uh, the guy decided to go somewhere else with that. Well, you and your sister both testified at this 803, this Legislature Act 803, where <clears throat> the law says, this act says that the, the injection well is supposed to have monitoring wells around it to notify the people in case some, this, uh, <clears throat> in case this chemical start leaking in the ground from these injection wells. And the time we testified up there, you was up there with us too, you and your sister. Yeah. And y'all did a wonderful job up there. 
I would like for you to relate, if you remember it, I would like for you to, to relate it to the, to the camera here so the other people could know what we're going through here. Should we put the microphone on him instead, Sheldon? Yeah. yeah. Christina, can you pass the microphone over to your brother? Just like unclip it, let it drop down through your blouse. And you can put it up through your shirt. At least then Christina will be in the middle, so she, if she talks, we'll be still here. Yeah. If you can put it through your shirt, we'll get you. hanging there. Excuse me for interrupting. <laughs> The things that they was asking of us up there at the time we testified up there. I was one of them testified to up there before DEQ. Mm, I, I don't remember exactly some something that, uh, that, it, that they specifically mentioned to us, but um, in so many words that they were going to, to, to look into the matter and um, they were going to get back in touch with us. Um, we had to fight very hard just to have some kind of public hearing, some kind of public forum on the matter, and um, we had we had that, and we had the opportunity to, to meet with those persons who were interested in putting up those injection wells down here, and um, well, well, luckily they decided to go somewhere else. Well, uh, don't you know after that hearing, we had to go to court on it. Me and your mother testified at the court on this. We won that case. And uh, that been uh, close to eight years ago now, we won that case and it never implemented it. Mm. Uh, I guess you all was wondering what had happened to our case. We won it. But they, they drug us through the First Circuit Court of Appeal. I had to testify to all these things. And sometime I look up and here come your mother. I was be so glad she would knock off from work and come up there and testify. With it. And uh, now, the last I heard of it, they, they, they grant them a stay. Judge Gonzalez grant them a stay. So uh, I haven't heard no more from that case yet. Uh, but we won that case. They went before the First Circuit Court of Appeal, and so the First Circuit Court of Appeal upheld Judge Brown's decision. So we won that too. They couldn't appeal to the Supreme Court because it it, it, it was against the rules in the in the in the legislature act as such. So mm -hmm. they just still made and still injection out there. I just wanted you to know mm -hmm. what happened to it. Do you know uh, some people in your age bracket uh, are they uh, they are they conscientious about what happened here at God's my first uh, as far as this the pollution is concerned? You hear them talk about it or anything like that? I think some. Some people are very, very much so aware of the situation out here in Geismar, particularly those who who live in this community. Uh, like for example, it was just like a few weeks ago, I was I was down I was down Coco Lane um, at the park, track around some remote park, and I was shooting basketball with a few of my friends, and uh, and we noticed that the air quality out there is is still is still bad. They, I. It's like I was getting flashbacks all over again, like when I was, when I was growing up as a kid. Um, right after a good rain, the, uh, the chemical plants would release their uh, their emissions, and it'd be, it'd be just like just like fog, just, just rolling in. And we just had to stop playing and, and and go inside, you know, whenever the chemical plants would release these these emissions in, into our air, and uh, it would just burn our eyes and make us cough sometimes. And, but you know, still, as just a kid, we didn't know any better. We just, just we just had to come inside. You know? But uh, it was like reliving my my childhood experiences again, just a few weeks ago, by being exposed to the same old stuff that's in there, and, and it just rolls on in. The chemical plants just they are above the law, you see, and they just do whatever they want to do, and because it's all about the dollar sign. To them. Lives here in the state of Louisiana, don't, it doesn't mean anything to them because they don't have to live here. Because after after five o'clock, they go back home to the big cities 
and and their suburban lifestyle and you know with the three story homes or what have you and live the plush lifestyle but you see they, they don't live here so they don't have a lot of interest here in the people who live in this community so therefore they don't care well mr jackson right now i'm on a technical t task force for edward edward there's 30 of us on this task force uh, they're talking seriously about taking ammonia off the, what they call, hazardous waste list. Would you agree with them taking ammonia off the uh, hazardous waste list? Ammonia is a chemical they use in making fertilizer out of that. That's mostly yeah. what you smell. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it choke you. Sometimes it make your eyes cry. Would you be willing to let them take that off as a hazardous waste? All right, first of all, before I agree to that, I think uh, some study had to be made before you make that type of decision. Uh, that's because you just take it off, you feel like you're not dangerous to yourself. Let's get some proven facts of it. And I'll probably go along with it, scientific facts. But just an opinion, I couldn't go along with that. Because you know um, this ammonia is very strong. Uh, well, well, just like tear gas. Tear gas is a harassing agency. This thing would deco decapacitate you, your thinking, it be so strong out there sometime at Geisman. Mm -hmm. So it's a harassing agency. And just to that fact, I think, would you agree that to keep it on the, the, the endangered uh, chemical list? First of all, they have to find out the reason why they want to take it off. And justification, so they could scientific, increase. scientific facts. So they could increase the release in the air. Yeah, That's yeah. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I disagree there. Okay. I think we have enough. Uh, well, pollution. we got a battle. We got a battle on that now. Mm -hmm. And I'm against. It. Yeah. yeah. We want to hold on to it. Mm -hmm. Don't lose that, because after a while, you're going next. You want to take do something else, and the way you go, you can't be giving the deep thing up unless, unless there's some. Uh, scientific facts. I cannot go, or you aim go against for scientific facts. Right. You know, what they're proven fact, we had to go along with the theory, you know. I would like to inject this into that. If you go on that sunshine bridge when the wind blowing from the south, you get way up in the air, you can't breathe up there with ammonia. I imagine so. Mm -hmm. So that's what they make fertilizer. Mm -hmm. Do you, do you have any story you would like to tell on your own without me interrupting or anything like that, pretending to any, any of our life, lifestyle have, have depreciated you in, in, in the, that we had once had you have depreciated to zero here? Have you anything you say on that on that point? Well, uh, talking about the community, talking about the community, the uh, guys, the community. If you would like to put advantage and disadvantage, it would be pretty close for us at the plants. I know other people will say, well, the plant gave us a job, and we don't have a lot of people that work in the plants here. So that won't be too advantage for us. And say, so, well, the plant are paying the share of the taxes. And of course, we're paying the our share, too. Um, if you may look at it for another disadvantage, uh, Rural life, you know, we are familiar. But we, we have, we have the desire here to live here. We want to live here, and and peaceful. We hope we can, and uh, the plant life really changed our life because uh, the average kid would like to ride his or her bicycle, but right now they cannot do it. Uh, Louisiana 73 is too dangerous. Uh, the plants and, and the Louisiana government did, didn't put a sidewalk for the kid to do anything. They have a nice park, and they cannot get there unless the parent bring the kid there. Um, for the guidance of concern, uh, we can do without them. Well, in your opinion, and I would like to ask your son that, why is I'm asking it to you after you finish, and then he can elaborate on it. In your opinion, do you think we're getting our fair share of the tax we pay in here in the St. Parish back into the community? 
Well, Amos, as you know, that's, this is a hard fight for the last hundred years for us trying to get our fair shake, uh, eat a share of the pie, as we always said. It's a constant fight. I guess there are no end. No, definitely not. Uh, let, me, let me ask you this. This, this is, is a personal question, but it's not anything embarrassing. Mm -hmm. Where you make the most of your grocery? In Gonzales or here at these stores here in the rural area? In Gonzales. Well, Gonzales take tax off for Gonzales on you, and they also take tax on, on everything you spend there, but yet we don't get this money yet. Do you think that's fair to us? Well, I guess that, that's the system. <laughs> I don't know if it's fair or not, but that's the, that is the uh, system. You, uh, Junior, do you think it's fair for Gonzalez to collect tax of the grocery we buy from them and we don't live there? Definitely not. And neither do I think it's fair for the, uh, for the state of Louisiana to prevent uh, the, the citizens in this community from for incorporating itself. We're not allowed to, to incorporate it have our own city. We have to stay uh, listed as just a little, a little small town, a small community without any kind of form of government. You see, because if we were allowed to do that, then Gonzales would begin to sweat, and so would the other uh, small communities in this parish. We would be getting the majority of the tax base. So therefore, that's why the politicians in the state would not allow us to incorporate ourselves. They haven't allowed that, really. Well, uh, and I want to show you another thing. Uh, I want it for the benefit of this film. Uh, we paying here in in a rural area uh, what we call a drainage tax that the city do not pay. But then the city got a drainage tax too. But we pay this drainage tax. Is that fair to us? They don't pay ours. You see? So there's a lot of things we must look into. We talked about it. I would like for this to go on the state. We talked about it. We come to the point of doing it, uh, of establishing the cooperation here. In order for us to have tax coming from these plants, these plants is in our community. And everything passed on this highway here, we could tax them. And every time we talk to some people about that, say like the politician, they're against it. But now, we have a right to have our own police here and everything else. Would you be in favor of seeing us incorporate this place and, and create a city out of it, a town, whatever it would be? Yes, I would. Yeah, mm -hmm. Ann. Um, well, there's just one other question I, w I was wondering about, and it's just about how the Ascension Parish residents against toxic pollution form. And also, if, if it's not too painful for you to talk about how, how your wife and your mother, like, was a part of it, what she did, what she taught you, you know, and how you're carrying on her spirit fighting still. Mm, I don't feel that. Like, yeah. That? I prefer not. Yeah, I'm sorry. I mean, I just feel like I wish she was here to be able to mm. talk to, you know, and I'm sure you do too. But, um, People don't like really know what you've gone through, mm -hmm. you know. She How was the second. Working? She was the secretary. I hear so many great Paris. things. Yeah, she's resident of this doctor's She was yeah. secretary. Yeah. Do you have anything else you would like to put in anything? on video? Mm. This is going to be showed every way, you know, so people know what we're going through. Yeah. This is happening. It in the We're still going through I think we need, we have to continue to fight. We have our rights, and we got to continue to fight for it. Uh, we know the power structure. You talk. We are fighting against that powerful dollar, and uh, like we started off, uh, there have been some changes. Uh, they are making some changes out there, and the plants are. But not enough. That's right. Well, uh, anytime they could put a man on the moon, bring him back home, they ought to, to like, put that chemical together, they ought to find a way to, to 
to take that chemical apart and putting it back to its original stage, mm -hmm. the way I see it. Mm -hmm. You know, one thing that confu uh, got me in confusion is what all of, all that plant pollution going up, what happened when you have a combination of these chemicals getting together? These are known questions that no one can un answer. Such as is, is acid and chlorine. Mm, yeah, all that combined. Yeah. That, what it turned to after the molecules yeah, merge up there. Yeah, that's that. a good question. What kind of synergistic effect? Right. Yeah. Right. That's a good question. And that's why I think no one addressing this problem. Right. You know, right. we're talking about how much pollution, how much is going in the air. But they never talk about what happened up there. I'm in a different chemical. Yeah, company. yeah. This is very concerning to us as citizens right in this area. Right. Um, let me try one more. What, what advice do you have to other people who don't live here, who don't know anything about living this close to plants? Stay away from them. It's a known fact that from Baton Rouge to New Orleans, we have the, ha the highest cancer rate in the nation. And uh, it's, I guess all what you may say, are a proven fact because of chemical plants. It never happened before. So we definitely, we know where it is. There's no doubt in my mind. Since the chemical plant move in this area, then we have this high rate of cancer. Uh, and, and this is a cancer belt, and we got to face that. And the only way going, the only way we going to eradicate this problem by putting uh, technology. The plant can do it, believe me, they can, but it costs money, and they don't want to do that. That's the only problem, with England. That's the only problem the plant has. They don't want to put the money out there for to getting rid of the pollution. And they always fright, they always go to the government and say, well, you know, we, uh, we, we find 300, I care less how you hide. I'm talking about a life, you know, to my, that's that meaning to me. Uh, you've uh, got a thousand people on your payroll. I don't care about that. I'm talking about you operating here safely. I think you sh the responsibility of the plant to not pollute the air. You know, Various the number of people working. That, that's not part of my, the bottom line, these plants have a responsibility to the communities where, where they operate first, rather than the responsibility to their pocketbooks. That is the message that we send out to those persons nationwide who, who may be watching this video. Wherever these chemical plants are, you must organize and fight for what is right. 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 I think we're putting up a good fight, but we need a lot of more people like your young people to join in with us. We're doing a, a lot of fighting here. Mm -hmm. as, as far as the tax is concerned, as far as the environment is concerned, and uh, uh, pretty soon we opening the gates here for, for other projects to come in here. I hope y'all will come and join in with us. We need y'all. See, a lot of people that are working at these plants don't want to hear this, but uh, what good is a million dollar laying in your casting side of you when you go into your grave? Mm -hmm. We come here and find this money here. Yeah. And when we die, we're going to leave it here. And uh, money is not everything. The Bible says the, the love of money is the root of all evil. Mm -hmm. you, got, you got to have money to live. Don't get me wrong. Mm -hmm. But you're not supposed to love it while you could see, see all these people dying out there and you still collecting your money and mm -hmm. forget about them and you the cause of it. You're not supposed to be that way. So uh, we got to fight for our community. I'm not leaving. I'll be 70 years old my next birthday, but I'm not leaving. I do just like we did when we got them from back of that church. Mm -hmm. Get our guns. They, they give me a gun and send me overseas. See ya. There's some of it here. Shrapnel. Got bullets in the leg. Come back here and they try to kick me off the off my pension every time they look around. Just like that desert storm they had there. Some of them boys right now, they're discharging them out of the army against the will. The rich man, son, don't go to war. They don't go to war. 
and it don't put chemical plants in it. It right. the neighborhood. Right. Right. It's always. Yeah, tell us about that mm. more. Like, tell us about that. Well, I'm, I'm pretty sure if you read the latest, the latest um, statistics and, and literature that's out, in, in every place, wherever you find chemical plants, or uh, better yet, that, that location, is always next to a low socioeconomic area or in, in the area of blacks, right. always. And it's like they equate a poor whites with blacks in the same classification with blacks, and they don't care about you. They just want to make this dollar. They don't care about, uh, about the, the, uh, the, the long-term harmful effects that these chemical plants may have on them. Well, Ed, do you remember when we was fighting that case in court about the false gene gas that turned, on, turned loose on us out here on our community for seven days? What that lawyer said up there? That lawyer got up there and said, well, if we'd have turned that thing off, we'd have lost $2 million. Mm -hmm. And Judge Brown leaped up. said, when are you going to classify a life against money? Can you tell that story? Can you tell that story? Yeah, I can tell. Can you, can you get him too? Huh? Can you get him too? Uh, I think me and his wife was at the... Yeah, yeah I, I, didn't, I didn't go to the hearing. It wasn't that. Yeah. That's when they turned that 4G. When we went there fighting to they had fine BSF one down sixty six thousand dollars for turning that gas loose on us for for seven days and we didn't even know it. That's when the people were dying like fly. That's when I I lost nine members of my family here uh, in thirteen years. That's when Nig, Pip, and Boyer, each a year apart, died here. They was turning that false gene gas loose out there then. That's a deadly puss. That man, that lawyer for the company told us if we'd have closed that plant down to repair it, we'd have lost $2 million. And the law called for him to pay $25,000 a day fine for each day he turned that stuff loose. The government told him to pay $66,000, forget about it. We went to DEQ, we appealed it to DEQ. We sued DEQ to re-promulgate that, that, that case. It was, they were supposed to pay $150,000. You weren't coming to us. It was going to the Department of Environmental Quality. And the last time I heard, it was up to $100,000. And that had been a long time ago we won that case. We went to court six times. We won five out of six with these little boys down there at Tulane University. The environmental clinic, law clinic down there. I was hoping Southern University would have a, a clinic like that because they got a good law school. Mm -hmm. We should have some blacks here to fight for yeah. us too. Mm -hmm. It wouldn't be so far for them to travel. But uh, really, we've been through it. Do you all have anything else to add? you have any more questions? No. I'm just gonna ask Christina if she, you know, had any words that she wanna, you know, relate to kids you know, like around your age out there about um, how you feel about the you know, you know. He's giving you the microphone. Thank you. You're real close. We should probably sit still in there though. Because it's gonna look like you're it's gonna look like you magically if we edit between one shot and the other, now it's gonna look like you pop on and pop well before you weren't there. Oh. Then you can't then you were so it's gonna look like you are a magic person who just like pops <laughs> when we edit. You know what I mean? Well if you see the picture, you'll see. You know what I mean? Yeah, you're see what I'm if we're in a close up on her, it's no, that's enough to we'll still think <laughs> you're sitting next to her. Well, you'll see it. when you come and we're editing, you're gonna see. Okay. It'll be fine when we stay in a close up for her. What was the goal? I just wanted to, um, you know, ask you to, you know, whatever you want to say to kids, say around your age and, um, you know, how 
how you feel, just like a relation type thing, you know, to relate to the kids out there, you know, how you feel about the pollution. Um, it's good to be aware of it, you know, and things like that. Well, first of all, um, sometimes when the air is bad, I think they should just go inside and stop playing just walk and just to be aware of it, especially when it's out. Because, I mean, you can't lock them in the house, watch TV all day, go to get outside and play sometimes. Just be aware of it. Yeah, I want to know a little bit more about, you know, your own experience, you know, how it's affected you, and, you know, how you feel about that, how you just feel about this whole thing, about this, you know, the war, the air, the land, and what's being done, how you feel about that. I feel that little progress is being done about it. Um, little progress is being done about what, say? The air. Or, um, you said, repeat that again, that you feel a little, pro little progress is being done about the pollution. Mm -hmm. And repeat that again. A little, a little progress is being done with the pollution. I feel that we need to take a step and do something about it so we can have a better environment. So 50 years from now, everybody don't be on the street coughing and everybody don't be sick. You know, we just, if we don't do something, I hate to see what it look like the next 50 years. It just be terrible. So we need to do something about it now before it gets worse. But the plants are making progress. I know several plants. We visited uh, several plants in this area for the last couple of months, and we're not taking their words. And these are facts. We are visiting that plant, and some of them are making progress, spending more money on the pollution devices. And however, there are some not doing nothing, and we after those. Uh, the next decade. We hope that this will be a better place to live. And we're not going to sit quiet. You cannot sit quiet with long Amos around. <laughs> Amos not going to let you sit quiet. We're we going to get down to We're going to go out there. And we, they're going to clean up this mess. Uh, we ain't, we're not expect the children to do this for us. You know, we're going to do that because pollution is something that perhaps some of the things that you, you cannot see. So therefore, the, the, the children playing outside, they're not aware of it. But 10 years, 20 years from now, now the effect come from it. And this is when it, uh, they start having problems. And therefore, we're not going to wait until that uh, happened anymore. Uh, when it first, in 57, they came here, we wasn't aware of all this. Frankly, we didn't know. We wasn't aware of it. But 20 years from that, then we, now you start seeing things start happening, 82, 85, 86, and so on. That's when people start coming down with cancer. So therefore, we got to relearn our lesson, so we're going to continue on working until we clean up the mess around here. Any other, anything else anybody wants to say? Three, two, one, I'm rolling. So. Okay, so you just try to see, if you had three minutes to give the world your story, Try it. Um, well, we were exposed by a super fun hazardous waste site next to our area. They came up there, the federal government and 11 major companies went in there with a plan to uh, clean it up, which didn't work. They gassed us, which we worked next door about 500 feet. They uh, gassed us, the contractors on the job, the area residents. So we organized 
and uh, it was six to one major chemicals in this area, which they could identify. But uh, they were gassing us so bad, getting sick, nausea, throwing up, couldn't hardly work. So we organized, we used the news media, government agencies and things that we could and got the problem well known and people in the residence and area people well aware of the problem. So we succeeded in shutting them down, which was 11 major companies and gotten together to do this for our Superfund cleanup. Well, we, uh, we organized to shut them down. We were successful in shutting them down. So we had them shut down for a little while and they came up with a new plan, a 200 year plan, which will not work in my estimation. We're still being gassed. We still breathe in fumes. We still have the fear of cancer. We have sinus problems, respiratory problems, immune system damage, and uh, numerous other things where it might affect me to where my immune system is broken down you as a visitor, you might not even smell it. You might not even be aware of what's transpiring. But we were there from the beginning, from the initial gassing, and now we're still getting fumed. And we're still talking nausea, dizziness, and it's, it's hard to deal with and to work with. And our government agencies, we don't trust. Uh, we're just it's at a standstill right now but we're still getting gassed and we're still getting sick and we just about at our wits end with it. But the problem we have is just when are we gonna really wind up with cancer? Or when is it really gonna affect us? It's been almost five years since the initial solidification of the Superfund site. So, I mean, my problem is personally is, is when do I get cancer? And the economics of it right now is, you know, you can't find a job. It's tough. Where does a man my age get a job? So I have to stay there for the insurance, but the fear is still there. The uh, biggest problem uh, after going through all this and then organizing and getting everybody together is finding a way to uh, attack the problem to be to get some uh, resolve there. And I guess now, the, like I say, the uh, biggest problem is, is being able to hold the interests of uh, the individuals together, uh, since it, it looks like it's going to be a long, drawn-out process. Uh, through this whole venture, we've gone through, uh, we're now on our third set of uh, attorneys at the know the present time. The issue, however, is not about the monetary side of it. Uh, it's the short-term and uh, long-range uh, health effects uh, from us being exposed to the toxic chemicals there. Uh, like I say, in that the process that's been a long, drawn-out one, uh, the biggest problem that we face now is uh, being able to come up with new uh, innovative methods and everything to be able to keep the interests of uh, our fellow workers. And to know the same time, uh, uh, tackling the problem, uh, doing something meaningful for it. Yeah, we're not shooting it. We're just okay. getting the shot. I think the most Make important thing we missed, who we are. it was, it was <laughs> who we are. No, well, <laughs> no, I think what we missed it is it's under consent decree by a judge mm -hmm. instead of. Yeah, we need to know to talk about that, uh, yeah. Gerald, and saying that uh, one okay. of them. Well, let me put it in perspective. This is the only. Oh, wait, here, oh, this is the only site in the state of Louisiana, a Superfund site, where we are affected by it, but it's under consent decree signed by the judge and the governor of this state, which is now Governor Edwards again, and it's the corporate people that were responsible, the biggest perpetrators. So it's a judge that rules over the site under consent decree, which we filed to be interveners to be a part of the consent decree to rule over our own health and welfare and safety. But judge, the judge over the consent decree, which is in bed with the corporate judge and the governor, would not let us intervene. Would not let us intervene. In other words, you're too. Go ahead and gas you, and when you break, you'll be replaced. And so I think that's the most one of the the biggest problems we have. It's the judicial system, the corporate level, and also the governor of our state. 
behind all? I mean, what's what makes them tick? What's the, where? What's the relationship of industry and people? Well, one of the things, the uh, relationship between the industry and you know, the people is, I mean, that uh, you got to be talking about the uh, the uh, dollars and everything that's to be uh, expanded there. One is that because of the fact that uh, when they went into the uh, initial studies and what have you, uh, we are quite aware that they use the most, uh, the least uh, effective plan to uh, do the, you know, the cleanup. Once that plan failed and everything, they came up with a new remedial plan one that entails a great many years, one that added to the situation there. So, the, so they know the, the whole thing there is just about being suppressing that which is, no, is actually there. I mean, the whole thing to us is just a paltry cover-up. I mean, that, uh, because there's no way that they can really clean up the site uh, in another manner that they are, are done at you know, the uh, present time. Uh, to clean up the site properly would possibly entail shutting down and the surrounding industries. So, you know, so therefore that uh, you have the whole corporate structure that you have to face in that you have, uh, you have 11 major chemical companies there, uh, plus our companies. There's the, there's, there's their business interest. Uh, if they would shut down, uh, they are telling us that they would lose the corner of you know, the market. So therefore that there would be no more uh, industry there. So that's to know that a bigger picture. It one, uh, it come down to the to the old uh, equation once again: industry versus the health and welfare of those that they are, are subverting, which happen to be the uh, employees. Us. Why don't you go into a two shot? This more like a um, this line about jobs. Can't clean it up because we've got to save jobs. Right. Uh, that's the governor of the state of Louisiana also said that, but uh, President Bush said that too. Wait, can you say what it is? Because I'm going to cut myself out. <clears throat> I mean, I, put my question in your... In I, Bush said before he went to Brazil that uh, he really put it in perspective for us, which is true. He says uh, he's, not, he's not shutting the industry down for the sake of jobs. And so what that means is we're expendable. Our health, safety, and welfare is expendable. Mm -hmm. Industry is not. I mean, do you think that people, when they're saying that, really, I mean, that's the big rap that they do is they say they'll give more jobs if they come in. Is that what's proven to be true? No, it's not really true. Uh, you know, if they clean these places up right, it would create employment. But they do it for pennies on a dollar. The bottom line is profits. You know, they went in there like in the beginning with us. They went in there, they chose the cheapest method. And so we were expendable. The working people are expendable. Industry is not. Okay, let's zoom in. Um, and okay. Since we were gassed in, in 87, and we've led this fight for so long, uh, my own personal health has really deteriorated. Uh, you have flu-like symptoms, uh, nausea, dizziness, uh, sinuses all the time. And this is, I'm talking personally, and uh, you're talking about going to the doctor uh, either two or three times a week, uh, laying on the couch after working a, a complete shift, uh, a week shift, laying on your off days on the couch two or three days or in the bed. You know, just trying to get over the exposure to this stuff. You know, same flu-like symptoms. And you know, now me personally, my throat started swelling over a year ago. And I went to the doctor and it's the beginnings of throat cancer. And uh, so since 1987, I was a healthy man, very well exercised, uh, good eating habits. And then the next thing I know, I was gassed and exposed to all these chemicals. And, I'm still exposed to them, and my health is really deteriorating. And uh, I have witnesses and where you sit around and you look at the lunch table and you see the same people having the same problems. And it's just not me personally, but my own personal sickness didn't start till 87. I've never been to a doctor hardly in my life until 1987. What was that one, if you could add that one, you said something about What's the use of a job if all you're doing is paying for yeah. medical with it? Mm -hmm. What it amounts to, uh, what it amounts to now is, is all boils down to this. What's the use of a good industrial job, which is a high-paying job, 
when you're spending most of your money for a doctor because the insurance companies now are in this reasonable and customary bit to where your insurance does not cover all your illnesses. Mm -hmm. So you're spending most of your money for a doctor instead of looking for and paying for the American dream, you're paying a doctor. And nine times out of 10, he's connected to industry also. And he won't go to court and say you were gassed. That's a really great point. Bingo. One. Okay. Your personal experience is what you've gone through personally. Well, some of the things that I've gone through personally and then being the overall coordinator for the noted group is that uh, witnesses, um, you know, uh, other employees as well as myself, uh, having the flu-like symptoms, uh, you know, coming up with unexplained illness, uh, there isn't a, a great deal of knowledge uh, in this particular area. And uh, an individual go to a regular MD, uh, they know nothing about what the symptoms are. However, that uh, a, a one such uh, physician, uh, Dr. Wells, uh, uh, available to us, uh, we uh, sent the employees uh, to the doctor as well as my own self. Uh, we find out that immune systems was no type of damage, uh, coupled with you know, the fact that uh, we work in industries uh, who uh, have chemicals themselves. So therefore, with uh, immune systems being somewhat already uh, er eroded, uh, it is being further damaged uh, in the you know, manner when we would know it was gas out there. Uh, this is you know, the biggest plight. The other part of it is, the, you know, the fear that uh, we know that, uh, you know, something that's you know, it's, uh, manifesting there, the uh, possibility of uh, cancer. This is the biggest fear. This is the overriding thing. Uh, one, the uh, employee studies expanding money, uh, going to the you know, the doctors, uh, trying to know the you know to find out uh, what's up and wrong, and then not, you know, finding it out, uh, you know, uh, this is the greatest impact. I guess this is what we pay for, you know, working in the uh, industries that we do. That's industries that's uh, uh, adjacent to a soup farm and cleanup site. Okay, why don't we go to a two shot again? So it'd be interesting to know how you guys, you know, are connected and what you're both doing uh -huh. to fight this. If you're each in separate unions or how, I mean, uh -huh. what brings you together on this couch and how are you really? fighting the powers that be? Uh -huh. Well, I was. Wait, 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 wait uh -huh. a second. Okay. Okay. Really? Mm, that's good enough. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, I was the leader in this when it, we were first getting gas and it was wrong, so we've never actually spoken. We're from two different unions. So I organized, I happened to call Dornell, which is a steel workers union, I happened to organize and say, hey, look, we've got a problem, a unified problem. And uh, so we decided we'd get together and talk it over. And then together, we got the uh, neighborhood and the media, we organized another local union, we organized some truck drivers, and everybody that were being affected by this. So that's how we initially got them down. By, we organized everybody, and then we had a status conference meeting on uh, the bluff itself with the media, and we actually got them shut down by that one little tactic there. So it did work. But, uh, union are you in? I'm in uh, Aluminum Workers, Local 275. And uh, Darnell's in the Steel Workers. And, uh, but, uh, local Union 8394. And uh, I brought the problem to my own international, and I was really, I was harassed real bad. And, and my own international union, I'm not saying sow me down the drain. They just put me in a little corner to keep me quiet. Just, but I didn't stop, and I kept on going, and now I'm still isolated. I'm still fighting, I'm fighting company, and I'm fighting some of my own people. It's tough, it's not easy, but we're still hanging together, we're still hanging tough. You know, picking up where, you know, where Jerry left off at, now that Jerry began to face the personal problem they had, then the uh, a group of employees, both companies, uh, felt that, uh, you know, that I would be a more suitable coordinator for another group. And then, you know, by being president of the uh, local union and what have you, uh, I was uh, elected the overall coordinator. And the uh, work that uh, Mr. Tillman started, uh, you know, I somewhat uh, carried the work along uh, with his uh, with his help. Uh, as I said before, uh, we have gone through, uh, we're in our third set of uh, attorneys at the present time. 
uh, trying to find some work of a solution. We think that we have it down to an art now, and uh, we are, are going on with it. The groups are still together. Uh, we have a uh, you know, monthly and quarterly meeting to where is that we uh, update everyone. Uh, you know, we have leaflets that's going out to everyone. Uh, so I like can update that's what's going on. When we have our regular union meetings and what have you, we also, you know, we, we go out there, uh, we have status of conferences on it, uh, bringing them up to date on it, everything that's going on. At the same time, now uh, we're exploring other avenues and then bringing other people in that we know that work uh, at the notice site uh, to our first our efforts. Uh, there also know some other things that we're doing. Uh, uh, and given the various updates and what have you, it's being able to keep the interest level of you know, the people there to let them know that, hey, that we're trying to do something. You know, new avenues each day is, you know, is opening up to us. Uh, some that wasn't there initially when we started out. Uh, but uh, we do have them there now. Uh, the thing that brought the two unions together because there was no association, even though we, uh, two industries side by side, there, there was no association between the two unions. However, uh, by having a common cause that brought us together, that has solidified the whole group, and uh, we have done quite well with it now. That's great. Zoom in just on a tighter two shot. Mm. Okay, now. Uh, you want to answer? Yeah, let me answer. Right. Sure. Go ahead. Brad? Mm -hmm. one, of the, one of the situations is that this uh, adventure that we've had, so to speak, has, uh, you know, renewed our faith in a great many things. One is in that uh, we find out that the environmentalists are not just tree huggers and the concept that has, you know, which is universal somewhat. We find out that they are caring people, you know, that they care about the very same things that we as union care about, you know, that, uh, and that, you know, jobs, the, the whole scenario is, you know, something there. Uh, and then it, it's just, you know, it is, you know, it's bad to know how to say that this incident, uh, you know, about that understanding, about that uh, appreciation there, is that now that we understand that, hey, that at heart we're all environmentalists. Uh, however, that uh, we do have different concerns and what have you, but those concerns are so closely alienated with uh, one another that, uh, you know, that now that we see to know the true meaning of it there. And then unions, which normally did not pay attention to it because we felt that environmentalists was on a kind to destroy our plants and everything. We find out now that the whole environment of struggle is a useful tool and that uh, we are somewhat behind them. And, you know, we, we are take our, take our hats off to them now and saying that, hey, that we, we should have embraced that concept years ago. We'd have been further uh, along than what we are at the present time. I'm going to zoom in on a medium just closer to you. Mm -hmm. You want to... Uh, Put your two cents into that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, when when we first started, like I said, and and we got together, is there's still a lot of areas that we need to discover. Uh, we've held tight and kind of hung tough on this thing, and there's there's so many. Even our international unions, um, like Dornell's union, is a wonderful union, and they offered all the information, even to me personally, a different international. Mm -hmm. Whereas my international union, their eyes is not open. They isolated me, and you have to look at it in another sense of the word. Where does your worker come from? Your worker comes from the community. So the community is concerned, too. And, but our international has kind of took a back seat to it. They took just about industry side and said, uh, well, you're going to cost us jobs if you keep running your mouth. But when the community got involved and other international unions got involved, then they started opening their eyes and look. You know, then they started providing some information. But it's it's still, we have a lot of areas we need to look at. And not just one international union, all international unions and all organizations. Everyone involved is an environmentalist in one, one way or the other. You might like milk, I might like water. Why don't you drink milk? I don't like milk. Cows eat grass. They drink pesticides, whatever. Your turn. <laughs> That's good. Um, any last words of wisdom that you've learned, advice? Well, and, uh, this is something that, that Mary Lee is going to mm -hmm. hopefully get out there to everybody. 
right? Mm. <laughs> but you know, if you want to get your word out, what mm. are your last words of wisdom? If you have any advice to give to people on how to deal with the today with all these things in front of you today? Well, we now we get to the future right. concept. <laughs> all right, uh, my advice would be is to research, ask questions. But the main and the most important thing besides organizing is don't get discouraged. Ask questions, ask different people, ask different organizations, be a labor union, environmentalist, whoever. Do not be afraid to ask. Ask the senator. Ask anyone you can use as a resource. Do not be afraid of these people. That's the best advice I can give. Right. Rolling, so whenever you're ready. Okay. My uh, advice to the, the whole situation is that uh, very much in, in fact, in the, uh, what Gerald said is that don't give up. It's tough, sure. It's a real tough job, as, as, especially when you're facing uh, the problem that we're facing. They are uh, super fun cleanup site. It's often tough, but to do your research, uh, organize your forces. Uh, and in the day effort of organizing, do something that's going to keep the uh, the interests and the activities and know the peoples up. Uh, you know, keep them in there of what to know to fight. Uh, utilize them in agencies, even though I know that there's a great deal of trust and everything. Utilize the agencies, utilize any group or organization for what that their worth is there, and then keep on fighting. Uh, it can be done. Uh, you know, if the, the will is no, it's there, and the interest level is maintained, it can be done if you're willing to fight. That's great. That's a great ending. Go. Your children, children's children. What? What? 2010, 2050. What's gonna? What do you think's gonna happen? Hmm. What's the future? If you had a crystal ball into the future, what do you think? Well, I don't think it's very bright environmentally. Say, I don't think the future is very bright, because I'm going to cut myself out. I don't think the future is very bright. If all we're doing is, my favorite term is reaping the repercussions from the industrial age. The data is here. The knowledge is here. The research is here. But no one's doing anything. Very, very few people are accomplishing anything with our governments our local governments, and our federal governments. I don't think it's very bright. Well, the uh, future, uh, I don't see the future being very bright unless in the individual themselves uh, come up and then take a stand. You know, uh, the, the old cliche is that one individual or one person really cannot make a difference. I happen to disagree with that. Uh, each individual or each person can make a difference. If that person is willing to uh, organize themselves to be able to fight the power structure and then uh, deal with them, I mean, you can deal with them because you are their making. You can, you can actually deal with them. But you got to be willing to fight. If that struggle isn't there and we let that struggle go past us, sure, the future won't be bright. But if you continue that struggle, if you maintain it and with some enthusiasm, I mean, even though that you're going to look on fail and on something else along the way, if you're willing to fight, if you're willing to organize yourself together and what have you, you can make a difference. We can change this oblique uh, situation that we have in saying that the future uh, isn't that they're bright. It isn't uh, if you lie down and just let it uh, roll over you. But if you're willing to fight, uh, we can change it. And I, I'm a firm believer in that. That's great. Say it again. Pretend like he's not shooting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, uh, I believe in the individual. I mean, I believe in organizations, too. However, the individual make up the organization. But the individuals know the whole key to it. If they, if they be passive and lie down, things are just going to pass you by. If you're willing to fight, willing to accept that struggle, uh, you know, even though uh, it's going to be hell. I'm not saying that it's not going to be uh, easy. It's going to be hellacious. But if you're willing to accept that hell and then deal with it, deal with it from an individual perspective, be willing to, you know, organize and and then pull your interest with someone else, you can look and make that difference. You know, that was a thing that uh, this 
American concept, what those I'm based on, is a collection of it all. And uh, I firmly believe in that. Well, you know, each individual can make it. We did it, and we're still fighting. Go to his medium mm. close, of, well, or yeah, to the, no, say that again. Yeah. We'll just go I said, we made a difference, and we've had some accomplishments, and we're still fighting. We're not giving up. We're going to make it better from someone. Great. Thank you. I think it was funny, Mary Lee was saying she didn't really want to, um, she really didn't want to, like, put lean on that one. Uh -huh. She said that one was pushing it. <laughs> yeah. It is, it's true. It's really good. But, you know, I really do. I firmly believe that since, you know, we were so ignorant when we went into this thing. Well, we were there. <laughs> I mean, we really did. I think we've done a wonderful job, and, and we still are. We've had our accomplishments, but I mean, there's so much to learn, and you have to go through so many people. See, my own international union, you know, pissed me away. 